Good morning. My name is Steve Hilton. I'm the Programs Director for Inseca, and I, I have a couple of thoughts for you first. Here in a minute, our speaker, Robin Hopper, is going to entertain you with, uh, with a talk. He has some directions that he would like for you to follow on screen. They're in white, so please uh, pay attention to those directions. This has been a lot of hard work, and, and it's funny. Someone just mentioned, you know, aren't you, are you glad that it's over? And, and a small part of me is, but, but it's, it is a lot of fun, and it's, uh, it's especially fun because I get to interact with people like the, the speaker that we're going to have this morning. It's interesting, the first time I, I always, or when I get to talk to one of, our, one of my heroes, I always turn to my wife after the conversation on the phone and I say, I just got to talk to Robin Hopper. It's pretty cool. Well, our speaker this morning, he, he has a, a, quite a varied life, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about his, his varied life, or, or just start. Um, he, he was born in, and spent most of his younger years in London, and, and he'll, he'll take over a little bit of that, uh, the younger years later. Um, another varied or, or, or different thing that Robin has done is, is he was an actor. Um, some of you might have seen him starring in that blockbuster film with, uh, with Robin De Niro and, and um, uh, let's see, it was Eddie Murphy in, in uh, Showtime. I haven't seen it yet, but after talking to Robert, or Robin, I'm, I'm going to see it here soon. Um, as an actor, Robin also told me that, that when he gives a lecture, he likes to do it with a little bit of flair, and the flair involves having a little bit of a trailer. Um, those of you that were here this morning, you might have seen that trailer if you were here before the emerging talent. After the trailer comes the body of the, of the, the talk, and after the body, he likes to end with something that's memorable, philosophical, a, a message, a high note for the audience. In another part of the conversation, what's going on? Woo woo! Woo woo! Woo woo! Woo woo! Great. More. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of clay and clay. Pushed around for 69 years or 25,000 days. I've been around with Leech Cardu, Volkos, Robes, and Saltner too. I made damn sure my clay was soft and came in many a hue. Come. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name, oh yeah. But what's amazing you is the nature of this game, oh yeah. Born in London, moved to Canada, when I saw it was a time for change. I built a studio in Ontario, but the climate was a royal pain. I said no thanks to a professor's rank when the mud turned ripe and clay bodies stank. For deep breath, pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. Oh yeah. But what's excited me is the history of this game. Oh yeah. Road six, this is where you go. Woo woo! Wrote six books. Woo woo! Crockery of every shade. I sounded out who killed the pottery. When after all, it was you and me. Let me please introduce myself. I'm a man of clay and glaze. I carbon trap for glaze maniacs who get blackened from the sooty haze. One, two, three, four, and pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. But what's puzzling you is the variety of this game. 
Oh yeah, get out, baby. Take it away, kids. Now, now. Well, there's a 19 second uh, guitarist going on here. And uh, I just have to talk a little bit to cover it. But um, I got into making stuff with color and working with color for years and years and years. And eventually I started to lose my mind. So I, I, I tend to forget who I am quite often. So it's, it's a little difficult, but you know, we'll get there in the end. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. Woo woo. So much stuff to learn, I just can't recall my name. Just as everybody's simply mud and all the seconds first. With necks and feet, just call me Santa Claus and breathe my rage and thirst. So if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy, yes, and some taste. Use all your well learned firing skills. Or I'll lay your goddamn pots to waste. Oh yeah. Pleased to meet you. Sure you guessed my name. But what's intriguing me is the complexity of this game. Oh yeah. Woo woo. Woo woo. Woo woo. Get on down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, woohoo, woohoo! What's my name? Damn it, what's my name? Woo! <laughs> Where are you? Come on! Tell me, baby, what's my name? Tell me, honey, can you guess my name? Tell me, baby, I'm a flame. I'll tell you one thing: clay's to blame. Woohoo! Woohoo! All right! Woohoo! Think big! Dynamite! Woohoo! Oh yeah! What's my name? Baby, what's my name? Tell me, sweetie, what's my name? Woohoo! Make mugs! Woohoo! Make my mugs! Woohoo! Lots more mugs. And now for the serious part, but you're gonna have to read fast. Up there. In reaction to all the death and destruction surrounding my early child childhood, that I'll tell you about in a little while. In my, somewhere in my early youth, I decided to try and make life revolve around making beautiful things. You can stop singing now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Woohoo! Thank you very much. Uh, as I, uh, I think, I think um, Steve got it a little bit wrong. You know, I had the idea that this was a trailer. It's 16, uh, six minutes and 19 seconds, and it's sort of preview of what's going on. If you don't like the trailer, you can piss off out now, <laughs> uh, and we'll carry on with uh, "Born in a Crater, Bomb Crater." I have a a very strange and rather interesting background. Um, I really had no control over when I was born. <laughs> Did any of you? Okay. Uh, I was born in London six months before the Second World War started. Can I put this uh, mic down and talk with the other one? Oh, I, is this okay now? That's better. I'll put this there. No, I was born in London six months before the Second World War started, and uh, I owe my career 
um, to Adolf Hitler, basically. Uh, this may sound seem strange to, strange to uh, say, but when I was um, in uh, uh, doing a lecture in Israel, they all booed like crazy when I said this, but I said, I came out of it smiling. I, I, I spent uh, five and a half years dodging bombs as a kid. Um, but I would certainly like to thank my parents for bringing me into the world an absolutely amazingly interesting time. Um, I didn't, as I said, I uh, didn't have much control over things, so I, I need to go on. This is, how hard do I have to press this thing? <laughs> oh, got it. I uh, and lived in areas South London where all the German bombers were coming on, and all these fighter pilots would come, from, come out from the uh, small airports all around and shoot down the bombers. And uh, this went on for five and a half years. Uh, the main parts of it were 1940 to 41 and 1944 to 45, but it went on almost daily anyway. And uh, I was fortunate to come out of it alive. And uh, it was a very strange time because um, all the kids in the London area were moved out, evacuated to all sorts of places. Some of them came to North America, some of them uh, went all over England, some went as far away as Australia and Canada and so on. Uh, I, well, I've always been a really difficult kid. I got chicken pox the day before. Everybody went and I wasn't allowed to go. And my siblings went and I never saw them for two years. All the kids in, in the London area were gone. There were no kids. It was very, very eerie sort of thing. So I was only in a land of adults. And when the kids came back at the end of the war, the end of the uh, period of time they were away, uh, I didn't know who my siblings were. And I never bonded with them, and I never bonded with any other kids, partly because you know, I'd had nobody to talk to except adults. And they were boring. And, uh, but I was fascinated by all the things um, that uh, were um, around me, things blown up and bombs and so on. This picture of me on the right, well, this is me at the age of three, okay? Um, I was born a twin. My, <laughs> that isn't my twin. I had a twin sister, but unfortunately she died at the age of 10 days, and I uh, never got to really meet her that much after having spent, you know, nine months together in a rather confined space. And uh, so I've always had people going away, losing them. They were either dying, being killed, you know, there are various reasons why these things happen. So um, it was kind of difficult, but I got into uh, looking at what I was around me. I got really interested in, bo in, in bombs, you know, my favorite toys. Well, London, London itself is all built on top of clay, if you didn't know. And uh, when the bombs came down, the clay came up. And it was just an um, amazing toy to work with. That's the only toy that I worked with. And, uh, the, and the other part was a hot shrapnel. And hot shrapnel has surfaces that are just like raku. Uh, incredible colors of burnt minerals and so on. So this is what started my direction in life. This is a little bit of uh, whatever. <laughs> you were all born individual. We see so many things that uh, different people uh, do, but they're all copies of one another. Find your own individuality. I have a particularly interesting background, but um, everybody has a very different story to tell. Nobody's had the same life. So when you do your work, follow your own directions and, and find out where you are. I was fascinated by all the dead things around when I was a kid, dead animals. I saw more dead people by the age of six than I'd want to see in a lifetime. And um, uh, I was fascinated by things as they were rotting away, like skulls and things like that. And I was really interested also in shells. And um, in England, in, there's nowhere in England that's uh, further than 60 miles from the sea. So I got fascinated also by shells. At the end of the war, um, there were, we'd been surrounded by soldiers and armament for 
many, many years, I've got to get a drink. And um, as a seven-year-old kid, I was f fascinated by all this militaristic armament stuff. And there's a museum in London called the Imperial War Museum. And I used to go up there on, on, a, on the bus on the Saturday morning and do, just wander around and see what was going on. I used to do this every Saturday. And one of the security guards said to me, uh, you come here a lot, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, what, what's the interest? What, what, what are you interested in? And I said, well, you know, all these things that people use for killing each other are fantastic. And uh, he said, well, you should try going to the British Museum and the Victorian Albert Museum. They've got old things that people use for killing each other. And they're very beautiful. So I, and you know, spears and daggers and swords and armor, it's incredibly beautiful stuff. Anyway, I went there and spent some time looking at that. And uh, the, in London, most of the museums are in one small area called South Kensington. And I was first interested in natural history because I was able to pick up dead things and look at them and, and look at shells and all that sort of thing. And then uh, I went across the street from there and there's the um, geology museum and the science museum and the, um, a whole lot of museums were there. So I really got into all this stuff, starting at the age of seven. And I've been an inveterate museum goer ever since that time. So looking at, on the screen here, you see some of the rocks I got started to get fascinated in. And I, th I think I was pre-programmed in, in a certain direction. My life has always been layered. Uh, I've always had two or three things going on at the same time. It's always been that way. Um, anyway, I uh, went to the museum and started to uh, look at the things that people use for killing each other. Then I went upstairs and I saw all these wonderful pots, great things, things that people lived with. You know, I'd seen things that people died with. Now I was looking at things that people live with various cultures from all over, and I got fascinated by ceramic history uh, by the age of seven. This is me as I was growing up. At the age of seven was when I uh, started my first play-related business. I was um, making small jewelry of... Um, floral, um, modeled, modeled floral uh, brooches and things like that that I used to sell to the uh, various hairdresser stores um, that were around uh, the area. So that was my first venture into business at the age of seven. There's a picture of me with uh, football there, uh, soccer. I, I'm, I'm totally anti-sport. I hate sport in all of it because it takes money away from the arts all the time. But this is nothing new. I've always been anti-sport. You know, when I was younger, they used to stick me in the, in the uh, goal, between the goalposts and kick things at me. Um, or the other major sport in England was cricket. They'd throw things at me. I would be the wicket keeper. They'd throw things at me. I said, screw you, I don't want to do this. And so I uh, left the whole sports arena behind and then was working in the arts. But all through my, my teenage years, I was an actor. Um, not always a professional actor, but I came, became a professional actor. And that's me on the right-hand side, uh, as in my first West End show in London, which was a play called Inherit the Wind. Um, really interesting play. Um, through my theatre associations, I got to meet a lot of interesting people, uh, people like Duke Ellington. I worked with the Beatles when they were making their first film, The uh, Hard Day's Night. I was working on the uh, stage crew in that particular theatre that they made the film in. So uh, it was really interesting times. Uh, I was reasonably good in art because I had no friends. I didn't make friends easily. I still don't make friends easily because I'm always thinking they're going to be going away or bombed or somebody's going to kill them or whatever. So um, I went to, I spent all my time drawing and modeling and uh, that throughout my teenage years, whatever time was left from, from being in theater part of things. So I went to art school at the age of 15 
and initially in painting and printmaking and drawing. And uh, that was my first choice. But it was a time before acrylics. It was a time when it was, the, you know, if you were in the painting department, you worked in, um, in oil paints, and I couldn't take the, uh, the smell of, of turpentine and uh, olive oil, to, you know, oil together. And so I moved out into the clay area, and it, it was just like, you know, a duck to water. I'd been working with clay since the age of three, and I was suddenly back into it, and this was it. it was, but I had to had later on have an income, and so the income came initially from the theater business. So this is student work, age, age 17, more student work, age 19. And then I uh, realized that it's, at that time, at the uh, late 50s, end of the 50s, early 60s, there was no way you could make a living doing anything other than functional work in England. And I wanted to make a living and be in the clay world, so I decided on a range of functional work, which I've done for 45 years, until last year when I quit. When you've made your first 100,000 coffee mugs, they don't have the excitement anymore. <laughs> but they've still got to be good because they've got your name on. And so bit by bit, um, I've uh, moved on from there. And we'll get into that in a short while. So uh, this is all you're going to see of my functional work. I did it for 45 years. Let me get into living on a tidal wave. Um, I uh, think the tidal wave is all the people that I met, got to know, either talked to, some, some of them I didn't know. And these, you know, since I come from England, many of you will not know some of these names, um, but they were very important influences in my life. Um, the first one being Hans Koper, a, a German Jew who escaped from um, uh, Germany in 1934, and then was interred by the, the uh, British government in Canada for a, a period of time. <clears throat> and then I uh, was um, really a beloved of um, Lucy Ree, and the other person who was very important in my early directions were, was a man called William State Murray, who was the uh, head of the uh, um, Royal, College, Royal College of Art in uh, London, and he used to make, he was one of the first people that made art pots in England, up to about five or six feet high. Um, he eventually became a hermit in the South Africa and um, sort of disappeared out of view. I knew that I was going to have to be a functional potter. It wasn't my, my original direction. I wanted to do, I wanted to do artwork, but um, m m the income was uh, coming from the functional pottery and the the people that really influenced me strongly at that time were Michael Cass and Ray Finch, and then um, Alan Cage Smith, Harry Davis, all very fine, super fine uh, functional potters. And then, um, because I was a painter initially, I was fascinated by the painterly aspect of ceramics. And, um, on this slide, you have Ta Thomas Samuel Hale, who unfortunately died young. He was killed in a motorcycle accident at the age of 38, but a very promising uh, existentialist artist doing work on ceramic forms. And he was one of the first people that I really gravitated to. And I was really fortunate when I was you know, doing my school years um, in London every year there was a, an exhibition of Picasso ceramics. I think Picasso probably is the most important ceramic artist of the 20th century, much underestimated. But he was the, the, uh, the, the, the guts behind much of what happened in North America started from, uh, from that source. So I, I was there at the time when the glazes that were being used on functional pottery were um, uh, celadon, temoku, and high aluminum mat. And everybody used them. It was bloody boring. And I wanted color. And there were very few books that did anything about color uh, at all. So I decided I needed to learn myself. So I worked with every material. Initially, because I'd, I'd done a lot of work in the um, 
in the museum in London, in the um, uh, geology museum. I was fascinated by that and the relationship that is there between the basic rock and the glaze that we make out of those basic rocks. So I'm not doing a glaze lecture here, but just for instance. And um, these are some of the things I was fascinated by. I really wanted to get color. And so I started to work and try every single material on its own, every, every material in, in combination with other material to build up an understanding of what it is that, that uh, makes glaze and color development. <clears throat> in, the, um, in the glazed surface. So I spent about 25 years doing that. And these are some of the things, if you've seen my books, if you know my books, you'll know these things, the different colors that come from iron. And the old books would say, you know, iron will give you black or, or uh, green, so it will, but it'll also give you pink, gray, purple, yellow, blue, um, and uh, a number of other tones as well. And the other books would also say colors from copper are basically red and green. Red in oxidation, green in, uh, in um, reduction. Or is the other way around? Red in reduction, green in oxidation. But copper can give you yellow, pink, a whole variety of blues, uh, black, um, salmon colored. This is just a few things here. So I was really delving into all of that. And after 25 years of, of doing this, research and looking into this material, and it's not that difficult, it's just tedious. Um, I uh, had masses and masses of notes, and I was uh, um, asked to, uh, if I would, I, I wrote some articles for a magazine, the, the British uh, Ceramic Review magazine, on simplified glaze and color, so people would understand what it's all about. And um, so, uh, Eventually, um, I was asked to, uh, to uh, do a book from those articles, and that was my first book. I'm putting in a, a pitch here. You know, I know we're in, in a, an educational group, and I know you can't use lead and barium and uh, probably lithium as well in your classrooms at this point, but you can use them at home. <laughs> okay? If you remove barium, lead, and lithium from your list of materials to make glazes with, you also remove almost 40% of the potential color range that is out there. So if you want to work with good, bright colors, still keep those in mind, okay? So well, this was the first book I wrote, um, Ceramic Spectrum. Uh, the last four words of which are try it and see. We live in an instant coffee society. Everybody wants it now, and the, uh, they're not prepared to work for it. But you learn a whole lot more if you did a little bit of work. I, when I was halfway through making uh, the, fun, fun, the, the um, ceramic spectrum, I started to look at the... Uh, uh, think about the books that I looked for when I was in the teaching business. I only stayed in the teaching business for five years. Um, I have an absolute paranoia hate of administrivia. Okay. I, uh, so I said, I, I, you know, and I know that the further up the tree you go in the educational world, the less you have to deal with students and the more administrative you have to deal with. So that wasn't an option, so I decided to quit teaching and um, just make it on clay. And I, there's never been a problem with that. But when I was working with Ceramic Spectrum book, I, um, I thought of other books that, that should be out there, and so I decided to write them. Uh, Functional Pottery was my second book. Making Marksman was my third book. And um, these are three other books. I was asked to uh, rewrite or to edit and change where necessary clay and glazes for the potter. The um, uh, basically uh, Daniel Rhodes uh, seminal book for studio artists. And then I did a book on survival tactics and uh, an autobiography as well. But talking about ideas, you know, my, since I've been around so long, 
Uh, you know, I, I get to be t 72 in a couple of weeks' time. So I have been pushing clay around for 69 years. And over that time, you get a lot of variable things that you, you, uh, you cover, or at least I do. And I'm fascinated by many of these different things, architecture being a major one of them. I look at architecture, or I look at parts, as miniature architecture. And I, you know, when you see interesting buildings, I try and shake up uh, my visual senses and other people's vis visual senses by turning the slides upside down. And so you, you look at the object that you're looking at, whether it's a building or whether it's a bridge or something like the geodesic dome of um, uh, Buckminster Fuller, giving you ideas, and that's what that's about. So I followed that and, uh, for quite a while. The Museum of Civilization in Ottawa on the left is uh, uh, where the largest public collection of my work is. And other people also look at uh, architecture as a major source of inspiration. The one on the right here, if you know the work of Bernard Leach, you'll recognize that top tier of the, um, of the Temple of Heaven in Beijing. That's the, uh, the, the casserole form that Bernard Leach made. You're looking at detail architecture like Barcelona is full of the work of Gaudi, and it's just amazingly sculptural, beautiful buildings. So I, I just keep looking at those sort of things. I'm not going to spend any great amount of time on these things because my interests and my um, ideas and inter inspirations come from a lot of different areas. One is the landscape. Um, I live 10 minutes walk from where this picture is taken from. And I, what I wanted to do with an understanding of glaze and color is to be able to work like a painter but on a ceramic surface. Initially, I'm working with um, plates and uh, slab built forms um, like you see here and here. I was always, always fascinated Amer by the American Expressionist painting group. Um, the um, people like Mark Rom, uh, but I have a drink. People like Mark Rothko, Franz Klein, Jack Jackson, Pollock, they're all very strong influences on the way that look at space. And whether I look at nature or whether I look at paintings, it doesn't really matter. It gives me ideas which I then have to translate somehow. Now, the, one of the other areas that are particularly important to the way I look at things, for me, is uh, the process itself. What can you do with this? What can you do with that? How far can you push it? And so these are a, a few examples of that. I do a lot of work with colored clays and always have done. And this relates, again, back to geology because ceramic um, layering of uh, colored clays is just the same as sedimentary rock formations. So this is what is going on here. This is laminated colored clays, porcelain, um, and then they're fluted most of the time. I also facet them and do different things with them, but uh, a variety, variety of different things being worked that way. Um, like here, I'm faceting with a plane. And I was uh, in Israel a couple of years, or well, about four, four years ago, I think. And I was taken to an area at the south end of the, um, the uh, Dead Sea where they had major flash floods come through. And there was a buildup of layer after layer after layer of sand and dolomite and sand and dolomite that creates these patterns in this rock on the, on the uh, screen there. And that is soft right now. You can go up to it and you push your finger in it. It's like marshmallow. In 10,000 years, that will be rock. So I use the ideas of sedimentary rock, shell forms. You know, I, I play with different things and lots of different decoration processes, slip, slipware decoration, trail decoration, um, multiple uh, glaze. This is a Mayolaka style of working, but I, I'm firing, the, um, firing them at cone 10, and uh, it's not Mayolaka, but the process is the same. Comes out with similar with objects like this, or this. And I love traditional slipware 
I don't do it all that often, but it's just a beautiful way of working and it's very simple to do and uh, yet uh, creates absolutely beautiful, wonderful results. Normally done at earthenware temperature, but I do it at cone 10. Um, so uh, I'm exploring it in a different way from the traditions. I've been a gardener since I was 17 and a um, large part of my life is, uh, has been from that, sort of tied into that area and I've always wanted to make a major garden. I moved to the bottom of Vancouver Island uh, 33 years ago now and started to build a two and a half acre show garden based on five different, sty different styles of Japanese garden. And that's what gives me a lot of uh, interest and um, in inspiration for the, a lot of the work that I do. I can go into the garden and look like this plant here. Because of all this research work that I did on color, I can look at anything and tell you how to you know, work out a glaze recipe on the top of my head in five minutes and I'll have that color right there in a glaze format. I mean, that, that's a pretty, you know, diff un most unusual thing for most people to do, but it's possible. And if that's what you're interested in, it's a good way to go. So I can look at the plant, I can say, okay, in order to work on the part and make the colors that I want to, that I need this, 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 and this, and that's the way it works. With a name like Robin, you have to be uh, interested in birds. Um, and so I do a lot, I've always done a lot of things with birds, wheel thrown birds mainly. This is some of them. And this is part of my garden, it's two and a half acres. The, the sculptural pieces in there are, are a Danish artist named uh, Anne Linnemans, who sometimes comes to uh, um, Nseeker. This is Zeng Zeng Garden. So you get a little bit of the in input from the garden around here. So I use the garden as a continual source. You know, people come into my showroom. I, I sell all my work from our own gallery, which is on the premises. And people come in and say, oh, where would you get your ideas from? I said, did you look when you came in at what's out there? You know, I mean, it blows me away that people do not see things. And so anyway, I'll take them out by the hand and say, look in that direction, look in that direction. How many ideas can you get from that? And leave them to think for a while. I was in a, a mining museum in uh, Kingman, um, Arizona, which is where Kingman Feldspar used to be mined. And, uh, there's a mining museum there, and I was looking at all these things on the right-hand side of the screen, which are called core samples. What they do is drill with a hollow drill down and take out a plug of the, uh, of the surface of the, um, the rock area and analyze what's, what the minerals are that are in there, and is it going to be worthwhile financially, economically to mine that stuff? And I got fascinated by just looking at those things, and that's how the uh, core sample series worked out. I've always been fascinated by human culture from the time I was in, you know, going to museums from the age of seven onwards. And it was uh, um, just a, a great pleasure to see all these amazing things that people live with from all over the world. One of the areas that I particularly like is Oribe ware from uh, Japan, which, which was developed in the late 16th century. And it's a, a very painterly surface. It's random patterns of glaze and then other drawn in patterns with slips and, and brushwork. And it just uh, started me off on a whole lot of things. It's called Oribe. And I don't copy anything. I call it Boribe. <laughs> it's borrowed from Oribe. Okay, so it's Boribe. And these are a couple of examples of exploring in that direction. I was fascinated by the Chinese glazes and all the different uh, various, various glazes from the Far East. And, uh, and then sort of, you know, I, I, have a, I used to teach ceramic history for about uh, 40, 40 years. And uh, I just um, found that, you know, I was absorbed totally in this sort of thing. So there we are there. I also realized I, I was in, in um, uh, Greece doing some ceramic research in uh, 
um, about when I got to the age of 45. And I started looking at all the archaic parts that are there and things that you know, don't look anything like the pot, what the Parala saw who made them. Uh, because they've been buried, submerged underwater, the surfaces have changed entirely. And uh, I was just fascinated by that. I guess it was partly because I got to the age of 45 and wrinkles started to happen and skin tusks started to drip. And, you know, <laughs> you associate, at least I associate, I've got a strange mind. So this is part of the classical series the least decorated work that I have ever done. And I'll probably go back to it one of these days. But the thing that has really grabbed me um, for the last couple of years uh, is a material called uh, um, ceramic substrate. In, when uh, Nsika asked me if I would uh, deliver this lecture this morning. They said that you know, they'd like me to uh, talk about high-tech stuff. Well, I must be the most Luddite uh, potter high to using high-tech material out there. Um, but I was fascinated by this material called um, a ceramic substrate. Well, it's used for making um, circuit boards. They, they screen print the circuitry diagrams on it, and it feeds into computers and makes your computer run. Um, but the first thing that was made industrially for, you know, there was a crossover between the potter and the industry, is spark plugs. Spark plugs, the original ones were thrown by potters. The potters are so inaccurate that they quit doing it that way fairly quickly, but um, uh, that's the way they, the spark plug actually came about. And it was invented in, 19, in 1840. I don't know what they had to put spark plugs in in 1840, so it's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, the, the image next to it is, a, is the ceramic substrate. And I had this experience, uh, and a really interesting man, name of David Armstrong, um, who was a student of, uh, had been a student of uh, Paul Sardinus, um, wanted to learn more about glaze and color. So Paul was a one glaze man, 80% um, uh, Gersley Borate and 20% and 10, 20 something else, and that was it. He really didn't know much about glaze and color. So he sent David Armstrong up to me um, to take my summer program to straighten him out a bit. And uh, he came up, and he, he was making some of his money by making ceramic baseball cards. And that's what you see on the screen there. Um, and he, he gave me a few. He gave me the ones that you see here. And I was really fascinated. It's a, a decal um, st stuck onto a super um, high tensile strength ceramic substrate. And um, I said to him, I'm not at all interested in the sport part of it, but I'm really interested in the card that it's on. And so he gave me a stack of this material. And uh, um, I started to do some glaze testing on it, and it was absolutely wonderful to work with. And I thought, ooh, and all my, all my regular glazes were, were, came out better on that material than they ever did on the pots. And I thought, at some point, I've got to get on with this and, and find out about it. But, you know, lots of other things got in the way. I didn't have time. But the ceramic substrate was being used for the, the electronics industry has to be absolutely perfect. And they have a lot of seconds in the manufacturing of this stuff. And that was basically recycled or, or dumped material. So um, I started to look at it, and I contacted the company that made them and said, uh, um, do you ever have artists working with the uh, substrates? And they said, I've never had any before. So I, I said, well, do you, you know, how big can you get these things? And the, uh, so they told me, and I said, OK, well, maybe I can buy some. Well, so they said, we'll send you some samples of um, seconds stuff. And uh, I started to work with it. It's a, an amazing material. It's 96% alumina. And the remaining 4% is made up out of a small amount of silica and um, organic polymers which burn out during the firing. It's very strong. 
and you can use it just like you would use paper or a canvas or vellum or ivory as a surface to paint on. And since I was a painter and had always wanted to get back to the painting end of things, this was a major new option. So for the, about the last two years, I have been working, um, trying to find out how far you can push this stuff. And I haven't found anything that it won't do yet um, over that time. And I've got a whole list of things that I want to do with it. The way that I work with this, because it's high fired, it's been pre-fired well above cone 10. They won't tell me exactly how far above cone 10, but the, uh, it is well above cone 10. It has no absorption and it has no shrinkage. And so you can work on it like a, you know, a painter or printmaker or whatever doing things. Well, the way that I work, because it has no porosity, I heat the tiles when I'm working them to evaporate the water content of the glaze on a kitchen um, warming tray. That's what's underneath here. And most of my glazes initially are applied with a lamb's wool roller, just like a painting surface, and work with that. Um, there's uh, a mass of different possibilities. If you look at this image, I don't know how well you can see it, but um, I try everything and anything. Um, you know, I, I, the last four words of my first book is try it and see, and I've been try and trying it and seeing it for a very long period of time. So um, I thought, well, Conte is a, uh, when I was in art school doing drawings, Conte was a particularly beautiful material to work with. And I thought, well, Conte, what is Conte? Conte is a ground up, fine clay shale that produces a number of reds and red-brown iron colors. Well, I thought, well, what happens if you fire it? You'll just try it and see. And what you see in the top left-hand corner is Conte fired at cone 10. You can draw on it, uh, draw with it, and when you fire it, it's permanent and it's waterproof and it's quite wonderful. In this, uh, the rest of this image, there are some of the other tools that I use. You know, there's a whole lot of commercial things. If you don't make your own glazes, uh, there's a, a commercial world out there that is, you know, endlessly uh, um, developing new products for the, uh, the hobby potter and the professional potter uh, and the professional artists, and so you can look at that. I always make all my own glazes, but I've been testing some of the, uh, the commercial ones as well. I contacted um, uh, um, Scott Kilns and said, do you happen to have a second-hand uh, test kiln with a computer um, on it that I could uh, use or borrow for some research I want to do? And so they said, what do you really want? They said they didn't have one. And I said, what? They said, what do you really want? And I told them exactly what, what I wanted. So they made, it, made me one and gave it to me to do the research that I wanted to do. So that's this little kiln, little, uh, kiln that you see on the right here. It's only 14 by 14 and about uh, 10 inches deep, and it takes the six, six uh, shelves. But I can put about 20 small uh, pieces in there. And it just is amazing in, in what it will do. You know, I'm not just working with oxidation. I'm working with oxidation and reduction at all sorts of different temperatures. I'm trying to exhaust what the possibilities are, but it's exhausting me rather than me exhausting it. And so, uh, you know, these are some examples of, of different uh, glazes, different um, uh, approaches to the surface. You can combine things, you can fire down the scale if there's part of the, the thing that you like, a certain high temperature glaze, you can paint that on, fire it at the high temperature, and then get it out of the kiln and do some low temperature work on it. That's what the brilliant orangey red one is. That's lead, lead, did you hear, lead, <laughs> and chromium. So chrome lead glaze, wonderful zingy color. And the wonderful thing also about it is around each little line of red, there's a little line of yellow, and beyond that, chromium fumes and creates this beautiful haze of gray. So it's like almost visually three-dimensional. It's very exciting. Go on. So uh, I've also worked with decals. I had some old decals that had been sitting in the uh, cupboard for about um, 
30 years, and I didn't know whether they had any binder left in them that they would work at all, so we just cut them up and, and applied them to the surface. So this is decal on the uh, right-hand side, um, which is uh, fired at cone 019. Um, and I, uh, other thing I thought, well, um, crystalline glazes do not like alumina, and this material is 96% alumina. But Gordon Hutchins, who is one of the better potters in our area, is also a crystalline guy, so, and he was teaching for the summer school that I started 30, nearly 30 years ago. And I said, Gordon, would you do some of your testing uh, on some of your glazes when you got them together and put them on some of these little tiny test pieces and see what happens? And I fully expected nothing to happen. Uh, when this came out of the kiln, I thought, oh my God. You know, the great thing about it too is if you're a crystalline person, you don't have to deal with gravity if it's flat. You know, gravity is what slides the glaze off because the glaze contains no clay in it, usually. You can do it on a flat surface, you don't have to worry about that. And you can create, create crystal paintings that way. It's a semi-translucent material depending upon thickness. And uh, so it can be backlit, it can be used in a lot of different um, uh, um, ways for architectural use, like screens and lighting and so on. I mean, this is early days. This product has only been on the market for just over three months now. Uh, but I've been working with it for nearly two years. This piece here is the first ever Raku fired piece. Randy Brodnax is a Texan artist. Um, and I gave a, a number of uh, sample pieces to Texans when I was down doing a workshop down there. And I said, I want you to play with and do what you normally do and let's see, how, see what happens. So this, uh, this piece came out of a firing that uh, Randy did. Um, it was painted in five minutes and fired in five minutes. And uh, it's an incredible image. So it's the first ever Raku fired one. The one on the left, uh, right, left, uh, is um, Julie Brooks, who is the, um, uh, the daughter of the owner of um, uh, a Laguna Clay. And she's a, a ceramic artist in her own right as well. And I gave her a few uh, test pieces to work on. And this is Cone 5, glazed painting of her mother. The one on the right is a, a student from Sh uh, Sheridan College in Ontario, um, and she's using underglazed pencil. I'm trying to get people to use as many different varieties of things as possible. Um, from here on, and these are a few of the things that I've been doing, and um, just multiple layering of glaze, multiple firing, firing down the scale, uh, doing lots of different things. I'm quickly going to go through these. And, uh, and see. Um, this is underglazed pencil. The, the, there are a lot of underglazed <coughs> pencils out there. I haven't tried them all yet, but if you draw with them, you'll get a line. If you scrub that line with your thumb, you'll get what we call scumbling. And you can create beautiful tonal backgrounds that they can then draw on in other ways. And what I'm using here is uh, underglazed pens, Laguna underglazed pens, on top, once fired at cone, um, cone eight, I think, this one. I don't think they, I don't say they're great art or anything. I'm just using them at the moment to find out what I can do with them. And then I'll maybe, if I'm still alive, <laughs> um, able to do some reasonably good art out of them. So these are, this one here on the, uh, that side left is um, multiple brushwork. It's all fired in one time. And it's done like my Olica, but it's on porcelain and fired at cone 10. The one on the right is layered glazes fired at cone 10. And these are a few variations. So this, I'm not going to go on with this much longer, but it's a few variations of these different things, different approaches to the surface. And as far as I uh, feel, there, I know that there are a lot of people to come into this business from the painting, drawing, graphic end of things. And clay is not exactly user-friendly uh, for those people. 
this material is super user friendly. It's, you, know, you just behave with it like you would with all the paper and canvas and so on. It's an amazing material to work with. And it's available through a company called, um, well, it's called Por uh, Porcelain Canvas Trademark. And it's only available through um, Keraflex and CeramicArtCart.com. I haven't got that written down, but uh, the owner of the company is sitting just back there. Sometimes I'll use it and put a black matte glaze on top and then uh, fire that up to cone six or eight, then get it out of the kiln, then roll a white glaze on top of that and scratch through it, and that's what's happening here. The, uh, the two images, the light one on, on the left is um, in fired in oxidation at cone eight. The one on the right is exactly the same process, fired in reduction at cone 10. Same thing, different temperature, different firing process. So these are again, just a, a few images. So if the... Uh, Carousel of Life is just a dream. Mine's been a real reality show. I've had a ball. Uh, I don't think I could have crammed much more in. I'm 72 in two weeks, so three weeks' time. Uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around. My uh, hereditary um, family history is uh, rather short male <laughs> life lifespans. I'm now a lot older than any of the others were, so that's it. So. Uh, we're going to go out with a special epilogue, and this is another sing-along, okay? Um, the end is nigh. We have uh, approximately three minutes and uh, whatever it is, th uh, five seconds to go. Um, and now for some, something completely different from Monty Python's Life of Brian a deeply philosophical whistling finale that I'd like you to all to participate with so you can go out of here smiling and with something interesting going on in your head. So, here we go. I need a drink first. Some things in life are bad. They can make you really mad. Other things just make you swear and curse. When you're chewing on life's gristle, don't grumble, give a whistle. And this will help things turn out for the best. And always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light side of life. If life seems jolly rotten, there's something you've forgotten. And that's to laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're feeling in the dumps, don't be silly chumps. Just purse your lips and whistle, that's the thing. And always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> always look on the light side of life. <laughs> For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the audience, the curtain with a bow. Forget about your sin. Give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last laugh anyhow. So always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> always just... I missed it. Life's a piece of shit when you look at it. Life's a laugh and death's a joke, it's true. You'll see it's all a show. Keep them laughing as you go. And remember that the last laugh is on you. And always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light side of life. Always look on the right side of life. I mean, what have you got to lose? You know, you come from nothing, you're going back to nothing. So what have you lost? Nothing! So always look on the bright side of life. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Emerging talent show and uh, see that because it's always one of the more interesting parts of Enseeker as far as I'm concerned. And I thought it was really wonderful to follow that on with the aging and de decrepit show. Um, <laughs> but I th thought back to, I saw uh, Malcolm, my friend Malcolm uh, Davis last year and I, he did a wonderful job of the closing lecture and I thought, who the hell are they going to get to follow him? <laughs> Uh, and then in the middle of last year, uh, Steve calls me up and said, uh, we'd like you to do the kind of thing. Oh, God, not really. <laughs> so anyway, hope you enjoyed what I had to say. Thanks to NSEKA and thanks to the uh, crew.